Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Liam Hartree here today with another episode of Presenting Champions. Today, joined by a very, very special guest, Tyler Good, John El Tornado, uh, the bad boy of bare knuckle boxing. This man goes by many names. Obviously, um, had a great career in pro boxing before switching over to bare knuckle boxing, where he's become one of the biggest stars in the world on the BKB scene. Very exciting fights with BKB, BKF, B, uh, BKFC, sorry, all the big names. And today we're going to be talking about his life, his career, his journey, and uh, the mentality it takes to reach the very top in one of the toughest sports in the world, bare knuckle boxing. So, Champ, thank you very much for coming on the show, and it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me on here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure. So starting at the beginning, um, I, I guess I'll ask you about this first. You're obviously out there in Miami. You're pretty much living a dream uh, over there. We were just saying just now before starting recording, it's pissing it down here in the UK, but you're out there in the sun. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, the lifestyle in Miami, how you're finding it over there and what your life is like over there, basically. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously... This is the dream, you know, to live in Miami and, and get to train and fight and everything else. Um, I've been here about a month, so like I've, I've literally just been sort of settling in. I mean, the area that I'm, I'm actually living in is West Miami, which is very, very Cuban, very Spanish, um, like very lo like local Miami. Um, my gym is like, you know, 10, 15 minutes away, so, you know, easy to get to the gym. Again, my gym is... Young Tigers Foundation is very much, um, you know, full of Latinos, South Americans and, and everything else. So, you know, there's a little bit of a language barrier at times. But, um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be around all these opportunities and, and obviously the weather as well. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to be in Miami. You know, I'm, I'm, from, a, I'm from the smallest city of like 20,000 people back in Ely, UK. So um, to be here and be in Miami, yeah, you know, I'm in the big smoke now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, living the dream. And uh, it's inspiring for a lot of other fighters out there as well. You know, how far you can go and, you know, the fight game can take you around the world. Talk to us about some of your plans and dreams and goals, whatever you want to call it, for 2023 in terms of like um, certain people that you're targeting, for fights, you know, how your training's going and just your plans for the year. Obviously, at the time of this interview, it's right at the start of 2023, just for anyone watching who's going to watch this later on. So, yeah, what are your plans like for the year and everything like that, basically, you know? I know that's a big question, but let's start there. Yeah, I mean, you know, to 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 really build on, you know, the last couple of years, I think, you know, the last couple of years have been really, really hard in my career. Um, you know, I've achieved a lot. I come over to America and, you know, fought Palomino for the BKFC title and everything else. But it was a really, it was a really difficult time uh, being COVID, being in the pandemic. So it meant that, you know, both my fights here in America, I had to quarantine in a different country, then be able to get into the US. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't really feel like, I've got to show, um, you know, my full potential because, you know, the circumstances have been very difficult. Um, so I'm just, you know, just trying to build on what I've done basically. And, and now I've got a big gym behind me. I've got new management and everything else. So, um, yeah, hopefully, you know, 2023 is it's a big year. Like I say, you're going to see, you know, me at my full potential, um, you know, with, with everything being right. Absolutely. I mean, the future is very bright for you. And, and I agree with that, that, like the best is yet to come type of thing, you know, which is part of the reason for starting there as well. When we look back a little bit as well, you mentioned about some of the fights during the pandemic and some of those types of things. I'm curious to get like into your mindset or basically inside your head a little bit during that time in terms of how you kept um, the faith, you know, that those fights would happen, that, you know, you'd go on to more big things during a time when, everything in the world was like totally uncertain, basically, wasn't it? I mean, none of us knew what was going on. Um, so what was your your mindset like at that time? This is a little bit of inspiration for people out there about getting through hard times type of thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, the UK know how bad we had it. You know, we were in complete lockdown. Um, it was a very bleak time for everyone. Um, I got signed by BKFC. I got offered to 
to obviously come out and fight. Um, but yeah, I had to go down the route of, you know, quarantining in Dubai for 15 days, training by myself. Then I went to Vegas, trained by myself. Um, I actually caught COVID two weeks before the fight um, with Felony Bennett as well, my first USA debut. So it was just, yeah, it was, it was very hard. But at the same time, I, I achieved my dream. You know, if you'd said to me as a 10-year-old kid when I first started that you were going to go fight in America and everything else, um, I would have snapped your hand off. So, you know, it was one of them where, that I just wanted to achieve my dream, dream, no matter what the circumstance. I just believed it. I believed I could do it, and and I did. So um, yeah, it was a, it was a test in time, man. It really was like, you know, just even getting through, like guiding my way through airports and trying to get in different countries. You had to have vaccinations. You had to have this test, that test, and everything else to be able to, get, you know, fly. And yeah, it was a difficult time, but I just, you know, I just stayed on the path. I believed in I believed in what I was doing and and yeah it paid off. Absolutely, yeah. Now when I do these, you know, a big part of what I do as well as the sports side of things is obviously the inspirational side of things. And um I think that you're an inspirational person in the sense that you are living your dream, you know, you are making it over there to America, you are fighting over there. So again, in the same vein of that, like you said that you know, when you were much younger or whatever, you never would have believed you'd get to this point and everything. Talk to us a little bit about the time that you switched from um, pro boxing. Because obviously you had, I think it was 18 uh, pro boxing fights, some, some good accomplishments there as well. Obviously you switched over to bare knuckle. Now bare knuckle was getting bigger then, but it's still bigger now than, than it, it was then, if you get what I mean. So at the time it was probably like a bit of a gamble, a little bit of a, a, like a risk to take, you know, to say the least. Same type of thing, you know, what was going through your head at that time? What actually inspired you to, to take the leap, take the plunge and, and do what you're doing now, you know? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, um, you know, I, I obviously had the British Border Control took my took my license away from me when I was 26. Mm. Um, I'd done a podcast talking about how I use saunas and salt baths because um, I used to have to make 140 pounds. Um, and yeah, I spoke about, you know, a couple of stories where I used saunas and salt baths and a week later, the British Border Control revoked my license. So, you know, for, at that point, I've been a professional since the age of 19. So I've been a professional boxer for seven years. You know, I'd won the English title. I'd, you know, fought for the WB International. I'd fought on TV numerous times. So, you know, I was, I was starting to sort of build, build a real name for myself, um, you know, especially domestically in boxing. And um, yeah, then I had my license taken away for something that's pretty innocuous, really. Um, and yeah, that just that sent me down the route of bare knuckle because, like I say, you know, that was my job for seven years. All of a sudden, you know, I had it all taken away from me, and it was like more than anything, you know, all the fighters out there who who have had to stop boxing or retire from boxing, it's a hell of a void. Um, to fill in your life, you know, when, when you, that's all you've been doing for, at that point, I've been doing it for what, 15 years, 16 years. That's all I, I really knew. So, um, you know, I was just, I was looking for other, other avenues to go down and, and bare knuckle, bare knuckle took my fancy basically. Yeah. It's amazing. And again, you know, it's, it's still going down that sort of inspirational line of thought because you turned a, uh, you know, basically a very negative situation into a massively positive situation. You flip that on its head and obviously you're living a dream um, now, you know, and, and as we said already, the best is yet to come. Now, talking about um, some of your fights in bare knuckle boxing so far, obviously you've already been in with some of the best names. Do you have like a proudest moment or a favourite fight or, you know, the, the moments that you look back on specifically in bare knuckle where you look back and you think, you know, that was that was the one that was special or is there is there nothing yet that you feel is um, that good? Because I know you said earlier, you know, you still want to reach your highest potential, but I was just curious out of the fights you have had, if there's any that are like the most special to you type of thing, you know? Yeah, I think like, you know, I'm one of them people where, I, I'm always searching for more and more. I'm, you know, it's it's perhaps quite a negative thing, really. You know, where I can't, um, I don't sit and on my laurels. You know, I, I want to, I want to achieve more and more. And uh, you know, even when I won the English title as a professional boxer, you know, the next fight I, I wanted it to be for the WBC, BC International. It was, um, 
so yeah you know i perhaps don't give myself um you know the pat on the back i deserve really because i have been in some great fights especially bare knuckle um I think the one fight, you know, that really rings in my head is is the, obviously the one against Sean George, you know, which was only my third bare knuckle fight. At that point, you know, he'd had about 16, 17 bare knuckle fights. He was a really, you know, he was a big name in the sport. So to take on him in my third fight and and win and win the world title was obviously, you know, a, a great thing for me. But um, but then again, you know, afterwards it's just straight on to the next thing you know I'm, I'm i'm always pushing and looking to achieve more um but yeah that that fight was a great moment because you know it was just my first seven round bare knuckle fight like i say against a guy who you know massively made his name in the sport um so yeah it was a proud it was a, it was a proud moment for me even you know when i look back on it you know obviously i didn't get the win but you know i come over here and fought Lewis Palomino, who's the bare knuckle pound for pound number one. Um, and I come over here by myself in the middle of the pandemic, had to quarantine for 15 days in Dominican Republic to be able to get into Miami. And I come over here and, you know, I fought him on my own. And like I say, I didn't get the result, but it was a great fight. And um, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of myself. I, I take risks, you know, I've, I've had to take risks in my career. I've not ever been one of these privileged fighters with a dad that's been a famous fighter or, or anything like that so you know i've always had to take these risks in my career um and you know this one's paid off you know two weeks after the palomino fight i got a call from him and his management and you know they said they you know they're massive fans of what i do and they want to bring me over and be part of the management so had i have not taken that risk of going over there and fighting him none of this would have been possible so um yeah man just it's all about having to take them risks absolutely yeah i mean it's that's a big part of your career as well taking risks is something got all the respect in the world for a little bit of trivia for you when sean george was on this show he actually said that his fight with you was one of his proudest moments as well um you know so uh, just i don't know if you know that but that's out there anyway um so yeah moving on from that i'd also be curious to get your thoughts on like competing in the usa versus competing in in the uk now it's not to like look down on one like being better than the other or whatever but it's just like your thoughts on the differences um because you've done what a lot of fighters in all fairness don't get the opportunity to do which is obviously go overseas it's a lot of fighters dreams so like you know i mean i know some of your american fights have been during the pandemic and things so obviously that might affect it but still your thoughts on like the fans you know how people receive you what the atmosphere is like you know i don't really have one narrow thing about it but just the whole spectrum of what the experience is like the uk versus usa you know yeah i mean one thing i will say about out here in the us they absolutely love their fighters they love their fighting um like out here in miami you know it's been quite overwhelming really how much support i've already got in in miami you know i've been stopped in the middle of the street no end of times i've been i've been stopped in restaurants i've even had someone stop in the middle of the road in their car and shout tyler good john i want a photo and stuff like that so it's that it's you know at times it's been quite overwhelming but um they love their fighting here man so it's you know it's just great to be here and yeah be around such respectful support it's not saying that the british fans aren't respectful but i find that the american fighters you know whereas a uk supporter or, or, or a fan may know who someone is but they don't you know they're they're a bit shy perhaps to go up to them and talk to them here if they know you're a fighter man they, they just literally want photos they want to talk to you they want to know everything about you so um yeah it's nice you know it weighs heavy being a fighter here in miami and it's cool yeah that's amazing i mean it's just something that like obviously you experience it some of the fans experience it but like it's not something everyone would necessarily know about uh from the outside looking into it's something a little bit different moving into a couple of uh, a couple of sort of broader topics about this um simple one for you really but just something people are going to be curious about but not boxing like the pain of it versus like gloved boxing and stuff like that is it a lot more painful? I ask this in every every Ben Up interview I do because people always want to know your views on that. Is it that the same? Do you not feel it until the day after? Like, what's the, the situation with that with that side of things? I saw. I always say to people the best way to explain getting hit with a bare knuckle um, is that, like, obviously, you know, the facial damage um, is a given, but like, it feels like a burn. 
like when because you you pretty much instantly cut you know so it's it's almost like a it feels like a burn when you cut but um yeah i've been in like especially after the sean george fight you know we we absolutely went to war for seven rounds for that fight and um i ended up actually in hospital after that fight and i remember staying in staying in a hotel after that fight and i couldn't drive home for three days because my hands were so swollen um it's just um once the adrenaline goes it's <laughs> it's a real thing yeah like after a bare knuckle fight it's um compared to some of my boxing fights yeah the bare knuckle fights definitely take their toll on you yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, it's another thing that from the outside looking in, people sort of see it because obviously a lot of you guys do post the photos and things like that, but getting like your your views on it is cool. Uh, I'd also like to talk to you about your training as well. And obviously with this, I don't want to necessarily give away anything that, that anyone can use or whatever, but it's the same type of thing, like an insight into what your daily routine is like um, if, you, if you're training like with um, bare knuckle, if you're training with the gloves on or what the situation is with that. But also, it would be good to just touch a little bit on how you mentally prepare for a fight as well, because that's something that no one sees, except for like maybe your immediate camp and, and whatnot. So, um, so yeah, sort of two sides that like the physical and mental preparation for a, a big fight would be cool, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the difference between um, obviously bare knuckle and the professional boxing, you know, when I was a professional boxer, I was, I was doing, you know, sort of 10, 12 round fights. Obviously, the distance is a lot longer um, and what have you. So, you know, it, with the bare knuckle, we try and, you know, it's five two-minute rounds here in BKFC. So it's very explosive. So you have to train, you know, specifically to be a lot more explosive. Um, obviously, you just haven't got the time that you have in a boxing ring. And and for me, that was, that was quite a big thing because I'm one of them fighters where, you know, I, I'll – I'll drag you down the distance and I'll wear you down. Uh, and, you know, that was my style of fighting. So to then come into bare knuckle, you know, BKFC, which, you know, it doesn't have a square ring. It's a circle ring and it's only five two minute rounds. So I can, I can be a little bit of a slow starter. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm sort of, like I say, specifically training to be a lot quicker and a lot more explosive, um, you know, off the mark really um that's one thing and then you know the mental side of things you know i've been fighting 21 years now um and although you know a lot of that was boxing you know i i sort of just take i just take that same belief in there the same determination the same heart and i know really and truly like you know you look at my last fight um at wembley okay i didn't get the result like i say you know i was pretty much i fought two rounds blind you know the first two rounds i got my left eye completely swole, swole over. Um, and then I had a cut on the other eye. So blood was dripping in the other eye. So I literally had to fight two, two rounds completely blind. Um, and, you know, 99.999% of fighters would have called it a day there and then. But, um, but I fought through it. And, and to be honest, now going into to another fight now, I don't really fear anything. I don't. You know, the worst has happened. I've been knocked over before. I've been cut. I've had my eyes swell over. I'm not really scared of anything um, that the sport can frighten me. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it sounds stupid, but I'm actually more confident now. Um, yeah, I think, look, if, you're, if you get into bare knuckle and, and you're scared and you're worried about getting cut and you're worried about getting punched with a bare knuckle, you probably shouldn't be doing it <laughs> really and truly because at some point you're going to get hit. It's going to hurt. You're going to be covered in your blood. Um, and you, you have to react. You have to react in, 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 you know, a positive way to that. You know, you can't, there's no running in that ring. Absolutely. Yeah. It's some solid advice there, which leads me to something. Uh, I was, I was going to ask a little later, but we'll, we'll touch on it now actually is obviously Having been doing this 21 years, having been doing this for as long as you have, as I said at the beginning, the best is yet to come and everything, but you have accomplished a lot. You have faced all, all these things. So when it comes to somebody who's like starting out in um, combat sports, looking at it broadly, you know, they, they starting out in the gym, they want to achieve something, maybe they're still an amateur, whatever it is, they've got that big dream. I don't mind if this is like boxing, bare knuckle boxing, whatever it is, but just like your advice for those people. I know this is quite a big question, but maybe one or two or three things that you regard to be 
as essential, like if you want to do well as an athlete, basically, if that makes sense? Honestly, I think I think rule number one, it, uh, being a combat sportsman, is you have to have thick skin in this sport. You know, there's um, not everything, not everything is going to go, you know, how you want it and be straightforward. Um, you know, my career, like I say, you know, even as a 10, a 10, 11 year old, I lost my first six fights as an amateur. You know, you just have to have very thick skin. You have to believe in yourself at all times. And yeah, that, that for me, over everything, I think, just having that belief, the determination um, is a big, big thing in, in combat sport. Um, you, know, you, you know, technically you can be very gifted and everything else, but there's going to be some dark times hit you in your career. And I've seen a lot of fighters go to the wayside and you know, a lot of talented fighters who, you know, look great. And then, you know, they hit a bit of an adversity and that's when they sort of pull out and, and, and don't do it anymore. So, you know, the biggest thing I think, you know, is to go in with your eyes open wide and know that it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard, but if you expect it and you can get through it, you'll be fine. Yeah, it's a powerful lesson. And you know what? It's a powerful lesson for life as well, like any area of life, because I've seen I've seen it as well. Like just to underpin that so many people who are actually more talented, you know, but they quit. They don't they don't stick with it or whatever. And somebody who actually doesn't always have like the most natural amount of talent, but they work a lot harder. They're more resilient they're more determined. You know, they go far. They could be world champion or whatever or challenger or whatever it is. And it's, uh, it's, it's a very powerful lesson. So well, happy with that um, to be. To be but, but Day. I like I remember like a big a big story for me that people can perhaps take on is I remember like so I turned I started going to my professional boxing gym when I was 16 years old I was a, I was perhaps in one of the best uh, professional boxing gyms in Britain you know I was alongside like like people like John Ryder Darren Barker Kevin Mitchell Ricky Burns Anthony Joshua joined the gym you know I was I was around some really amazing fighters um and as a 20-year-old, I remember I went into my first 10-round uh, title fight um, against Danny Connor. We'd, it was the second time we fought. I'd, I'd beat him once, and we were fighting in a 10-round title fight, and I lost 96-95 on points. And a week later, my trainer at the time, he was my trainer and my manager, he, he actually released me from the gym. He didn't believe that I was going to make it to title level. Um, and as a 20-year-old, and I'd spent four years in that gym building myself up and and everything else and you know to get that phone call and be released by your manager and your trainer it was it was soul destroying it was absolutely soul destroying and um for six months i just trained myself i was still a professional boxer but i actually didn't have a trainer i just trained myself and then eventually got another trainer and then event about a year later i went on and won the english title you know despite having one of the best coaches in britain tell me I don't think that you're going to make it to title level. I didn't believe that. I believed that I would make it to title level, and I did. Um, so again, you just you have to have that thick skin, man. You just um, you know not just because someone says something to you doesn't make it true. You know, as long as you believe it and and you you keep that determination, anything's possible. Yeah. I love it, man. That's an amazing message. Um, honestly, massive respect on that, getting that out there. Um, because, you know, there are so many people who follow you, look up to you and everything like that. So you have this influence on people, putting that message out there. I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. So honestly, massive respect on that. Um, moving into the last couple of things now, you know, there's a couple more things to go. Obviously, um, touching on something in your life outside of the ring for a moment. Now, just to precursor this, I don't dwell on anything negative in my interviews at all. Everything's always looking on the bright side, looking on even from a bad situation, what people have gained from it. But you have been very open about some of your struggles outside the ring. I think you know where I'm going with this with like um, sexual addiction and certain things that you've, you've talked about uh, publicly. So the same type of thing with this is like, not so much dwelling on all the details of what happened because you've you know you've talked to some other people about that quite a bit but more like the process of growing through that you know and how you're looking back on it the other side now and everything like this can you share with us a little bit about uh again two sides first of all what you were going through and second of all how you basically are growing through it and coming out the other side of it and that type of thing if you get what i mean with this one you know yeah i mean yeah like i said i've been very open i, I feel like you know, 
I get a lot of really nice messages. I also get a lot of people reach out to me and want to talk to me because they're going through bad, bad times themselves. And actually, you know, that makes me feel very good that people would message me and, and, you know, have, have me to lean on almost because, you know, I can use my experiences. So in the last three years, you know, I, um, I lost two businesses. I lost, um, I lost seeing my daughter. I lost my home. I, lo I lost everything. And, and, you know, it was, well, I, I say it was in the pandemic. I mean, it was a mixture of before and after the pandemic, but, you know, ultimately I lost everything. And um, even for all that, I kept that determination and heart and, and come out and fought in America and, and, and was just trying to turn a negative into a positive, um, really and truly. I think, you know, you can go two ways with it. And, you know, I'm not going to say that, you know, it's easy to, to deal with, um, you know, mental health because it's really not, but I feel like, you know, you can be a, you can be a victor or a victim at the end of the day. Um, and like, if you just want to class yourself as a victim, you know, you're just going to go downhill, but, um, just got to believe in yourself and believe that, you know, times are going to get better. Um, and you can turn it around and, and I'm halfway there now, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm out here now, like I say, the last few, few, uh, few years, sorry, I've been absolutely horrendous, but, you know, look at the position I'm in now. I'm, I'm in a position now to really change my life for the better. Um, so yeah, it's, um, but it's a nice thing that people can, like I say, message me, feel like they can lean on me a little bit and take a little bit of my advice on board. Yeah, well, it definitely can, you know, which is obviously the the other side of like wanting to do this interview today is obviously there's the fighting side and, and like everything you've accomplished there, which is amazing on many levels. But there's also like the inspirational side that you have, you know, been through so much, obviously, in the ring and outside of the ring as well. Um, and it's, you know, it's very important to touch on that. So one one last question about that, if that's all right, and then we'll move on into uh, the last, like I say, just pretty much looking to the future again and then wrapping up. So with that, as I understand it, it was pretty much like sexuality and that type of thing was pretty much your drug of choice, as I understand it. And it was pretty much your, um, am I right in saying like your type of escape or your type of process, like people are, you know, use any anything else, drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever it is for different people. Um, are you sort of flipping that on its head and channeling that now into like the gym, channeling that into a positive way? Just, just like, um, how do you fill the void of, of an addiction basically with something fresh, you know? I feel like with, with the, with the sex, sex addiction, it was something that, you know, I was going through a very hard time and, and for me personally, this has come from, from the fighting, you know, I, I try my best not to drink, do drugs and everything else. So that for me is a no, no. And for me, like my personal battle, you know, I would, you know, sex become easy for me to, to get and, and to pick myself up when I was down on the floor. Um, and it was almost like, Oh, it's all right. It's great. I'm having set loads of sex and everything else is brilliant. It's taken my mind off everything else. But then, you know, I've, I've been speaking to my, cause it's only really in the last, I don't know, month, two months that I've really outwardly spoken about this to even to my family, to my friends, you know, I've said, I've done little things on podcasts and, and said little things, but I've not really gone into it too much. Um, but yeah, you know, like I say, at the start, it was just like, yeah, this is great. This is taking my mind off all the bad stuff that's going on. But eventually that catches up with you. Um, it really does catch up with you. And this empty, horrible feeling that, you know, you you have to have sex to to bring yourself back up. And it's, it's embarrassing, it's shameful. And, and like I say, it just leaves you feeling very empty. Um, so, you know, coming out here now, I am trying to speak more about it to people, trying to make people understand it more um, and things like that, you know, just because I'm not an alcoholic or I'm not taking drugs all the time and, and things like that doesn't mean that it's not addiction because it totally feels like an addiction to me. I can, you know, I can be on my ass, the lowest of low, you know, go and have sex. That will bring me up. But then an hour later, I'm back on my ass again, feeling empty and everything else because, you know, that quick fix hasn't fixed anything. 
Do you know what I mean? So it's um, it's it's really made me talk about it. To be honest, to it's made me talk about it to try and understand it myself. Because when you're when it's just you who knows what you're doing, it's very hard to understand because you're not getting anyone else's opinion on it or anything like that. So, you know, I sort of justified in my head, but it's it's no good. You know, when it's only when you when you speak to other people and you realise this is this is not good. This is not a good thing. Um, so yeah, for anyone who's who's you know, suffering with any type of addiction or mental health problem or anything like that. It, like, it sounds so, so cliche, but to talk about it can really, really help you understand yourself and and just get through it, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I've got a lot of respect for you putting that out there as well, because as you mentioned, you know, some of like shame and that type of stuff it is a big issue around any type of addictions and, and whatnot. And uh I know so many people, friends, your people in my family, even everything like that, who've been through different types of addictions. And obviously it is, um, yes, like accepting it in yourself can be the hardest part sometimes. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. It, it. What you just said there, you you have to accept that what you're doing is wrong. You know, it's not, it's, um, you know, you, you, you feel like it's the best thing you can do at the time, but it's not, it's, it's, it's the wrong thing. And in, in the long term, it makes, it's making it harder, you know? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, this is the thing about addiction. It's always just sort of, it's hard to explain, but it's almost like on a surface type of thing. You know, it's not getting deep into you to like what the root of the reason why you're doing that thing is. And and it's, yeah, speaking about it, man, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. I'm glad that you're um, healing and sort of speaking about it and, you know, putting that out there and taking some positives from it. Um, we'll move on to the future now to address a tiny detail about that quickly were you ever moving into like adult films and into that for like foray and into that or is that just a rumor and sort of a, like a false news type of thing that's that's out there if you don't mind me asking yeah, no. yeah. it's um so it all come about obviously i my my ex-partner who i was actually engaged to was a a big big adult film star mm. uh, and i'll be honest with you i i'm I'm not sure. I still think about this now. Whether I got with her to feed my, to feed this addiction and everything else, you know. Because when I look when I look at myself now, and I think, now I wouldn't be with an adult film star and everything else. But at that time, it just felt like the right thing, and and I I was I was I was going to start to move into the adult um, entertainment side of things and. And it was, it was, it was, it was basically trying to feed, it was trying to feed this addiction. Do you know what I mean? It just felt like, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to take me a few more years and a, look, a, a little bit more looking back on things to fully understand it. But, um, but yeah, no, I'm starting to, starting to recognise, you know, that, that that stage in my life was just feeding a habit, really. Mm -hmm. Um and again, you know, I used to say to my friends, because obviously, you know, I'd be going doing scenes with two girls and things like that. And it'd be like, wow, this is amazing. But actually that empty, horrible feeling that it would leave me with afterwards was horrible. It was horrible. Um, you know, I just, I just felt very empty. Mm. Um, and in the end, I mean, to be honest with you, the only reason it really stopped was because I come out to America and... I actually went to Vegas and I actually done a scene with a girl in Vegas and, you know, we were doing the whole OnlyFans scenes and things like that. And it sort of got advertised whilst I was looking for um, sponsorship to obviously help me with, with my training and everything else. And sponsors would not touch me because of it. They just would not touch me um, because of, you know, what I was doing in the adult entertainment side of things. So, you know that for me completely stopped because the fighting must come first you know if that's that's what i've dedicated my whole life to so nothing could ever get in the way of that but um but yeah man it was a weird time in my life i'm not i'm not gonna lie um and i still like i say earlier i think it's going to take me a little bit longer to for myself to fully understand why i did it and why i went through all that um it was a bit of a weird time man yeah <laughs> well I mean, we'll move on from that now, but thank you for, for being so open. Thank you for being so candid. And it's a funny thing, even from my side, like asking 
questions about things like that for people that are quite personal because obviously I don't want to probe into your life or into anything that's none of my business it's, it's not about that at all it's always just goes back to like the hope and inspiration with what I do and uh, thank you for being so open Will. I do feel like you know we, we live in a social media era where you know there are you know we we look at people like influencers and all this and we want to live that life and, and everything else but I don't really see too many people really really hit you know trying to help um, you know, that I see all this, ah, oh, look what I've got, look at the great life that I live, you know, and everything else. But sometimes you just got to be honest, man. I, and, and I think that by me being honest will really help other people, mm. you know, um, it really, really will help other people. And yeah, I just think honesty, honesty is the best policy at the end of the day. We can, we can put up all these fake posts of how well we're doing in life and how we're feeling so great and everything else. But actually, Sometimes people just, you know, people want to know how you really do feel and, and that helps more than anything. It does, yeah. And again, it's, it's something about you personally that um, I've got a lot of respect for as you are 100% real and, you know, there's, there's no fakeness there and you sort of, you know, you sort of put your hands up and stand for like, well, this, you know, this is who I am, this is what I do and, you know, some people love it, some people hate it, whatever, but, but it is 100% authentic and, you um, you know, I got all the respect in the world for that. And I, I say more people, you know, love you and got respect for you. But you, you know what I mean? I mean, you're putting yourself out there regardless of that. And that's, that's a very brave thing to do. And, I, and, you know, I don't mean this to sound cheesy, but I would say putting that type of thing out there is equally as brave. Like it takes as much balls to do that as it does to get in the ring or whatever else that you're doing, you know. Um, so, you know, that's that's not even a question, but that's just my my little piece on it you know i've got a lot of respect for that so um pretty much wrapping this up you know at, at the end of this talk now obviously we've talked a bit about your future plans we've talked a little bit about um like what you're aiming for next so the last thing is to give one more mention to um fans as, as well but basically anybody who's helping you because i always close out these interviews with like the people who are behind the scenes so you know people who are supporting you online people who are supporting you in person it doesn't really matter how they're supporting you but people who are supporting you one way or another anywhere in the world, um, they all often don't get the recognition that they deserve, not just for you now, but for anybody. So let's give a mention to those people, sponsors as well, like whoever, whoever it is, you know, um, let's give some shout outs. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I say, you, you look at me and, um, you know, I've done this and I've say, stayed determined and everything else, but without the help of, of some really close people to me, none of this would have been possible, you know, of. You know, I, I think, you know, before before anyone, a big, big, massive shout out has to go to my mum and dad. You know, my mum and dad have stuck by me through thick and thin and, and they've really seen the worst of this game alongside, obviously, you know, me being a champion and the good times. They have seen the very, very worst of it and they've just stuck by me, man. I've been, I'm so blessed to have a mum and dad like I have. And and to be honest, you know, coming out to Miami and everything else, and like I say, you know, I love it and this is my dream, but um, it's, it's been hard being away from, from my mum and dad for that reason, just because they have been so supportive of me. Um, I also, you know, obviously, Lewis Palomino, when I come out here and we fought, and then two weeks later, he's just handed me this golden opportunity to get a work visa. You know, Ralph at Florida Yachts International, who, who is actually Lewis Palomino's sponsor, he's the one who blessed me with this work visa. Um, and like I say, just, just a massive opportunity, massive opportunity. You know, people like me, I'm from Ely, Cambridge, man. I can't stress how small of a country city this is. You know, people don't come to Miami on holiday, let alone come here to live it. So, um, yeah, you know, that, that, you know, them bless me with that work visa is obviously huge. And then I have, I've got sponsors from back home. I've got a guy who has just, again, has stuck by me through thick and thin, Daniel Lawrence Plumbing and Heating, he, just like, you know, a plumbing firm from my hometown in Ely. And again, he's done everything for me to be here, like to get to Miami. And I just know that he's so happy that I'm here. Um, you know, he messages me and rings me out here and 
make, making sure that I'm all happy, I've got everything I need and just such a selfless person, you know. Um, you know, he's not doing this for, for any other reason than the fact that he just wants me to succeed and succeed at my dream. So, um, and another one, civil, um, Lawson Civil Engineering, another guy who, who's just stuck by me and, and yeah, just made it all possible, really. It's, um, you know, fight, at the end of the day, fighters need sponsors, need sponsorship, need people that, you know, generous people that just want to, like I said, just want to see you succeed. So, um, yeah, man, I'm lucky. I am lucky. I've got some cool, really cool people around me. Um, who are just basically making this happen for me. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, I mean, uh, I'm very pleased to hear that, you know, these these people are sticking by you. Um, I mean, I see a lot of love and support out there, like on the internet and, and whatnot. But at the same time, when it's those people close to you, like I say, it's beautiful to give them a shout out um, for what they're doing, basically behind the scenes, you know, from, from everyone else's point of view. Um, well, I mean, we've talked about some good stuff here. Obviously, we've talked about the fights and everything, but I'm, I'm happy we've gone a bit deeper into some stuff that can really uh, help people and, and influence people positively. So the last thing for me to do is, is basically wrap this up. Just say thank you again for your time. Thank you for taking time out of your day and this you know it's been awesome talking with you i've enjoyed it and i hope you have as well so thank you oh thank you very much liam i appreciate it mate it's just it's nice like i say like most interviews that i do sort of don't delve into that you know that deeper but it needs these are things that need to be spoke about they are they do need to be spoke about um especially for young athletes coming up like i said about the whole having thick skin and everything else you know it's not you know there's going to be hard times there's going to be really tough times um but there are going to be good times as well and you just gotta yeah man you just gotta have that determination and that thick skin like i say it's um it's not going to be easy but yeah you can do it and if anything's possible I'll, i'm i'm testament to that man i'm out here in miami training with lewis palomino and his coach and the rest of the gang um, and I'm just a little city, oh, well, a little country city boy uh, from the middle of nowhere doing, doing big things. So, you know, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Absolutely. It's a beautiful message. And uh, thank you for, for putting that in there just to reinforce everything we've talked about. It's, it's amazing. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.